Vice President Bharat Jagdeo dismissed concerns raised by the World Bank regarding a potential decline in global oil prices due to an anticipated oversupply. The World Bank's latest Commodity Markets Outlook report forecasted that an oil glut and other factors may lead to a substantial drop in global prices and an oversupply in the coming years. Addressing the matter at his weekly press conference at Freedom House, Rob Street, Georgetown, Jagdeo criticized the relevance of such forecasts to Guyana's oil prospects. Kayator News had reported that the World Bank's latest Commodity Markets Outlook report raised doubts about the Vice President's projections of substantial future revenue for Guyana. Jagdeo has suggested that by not implementing a ring-fencing provision for the oil projects in the Stabroke block which is operated by ExxonMobil Guyana Limited, the country is strategically foregoing short-term benefits to reap greater long-term gains. In simple terms, a ring-fencing provision in an oil contract ensures that each oil project is financially independent, meaning it can only use its revenue to cover its own costs. Based on his previous comments, Jagdeo was asked whether the World Bank's forecast changes his position on the lack of ring fencing provisions for the oil projects in the Stabroke block. In his response, Jagdeo downplayed the bank's influence on oil market insights. He highlighted Guyana's low production costs and the high quality of its crude. Oil is currently being produced from the Stabroke block, which is operated by ExxonMobil Guyana Limited, EMGL. Daily production is over 650,000 barrels per day from just three projects in that block. Often, people who are uninitiated, um, they put a lot of store on these IFIs and the reports they produce. For people who are actually in the sector, they, play, they pay scant regard to those reports. So if you ask any of the oil majors around the world, about this World Bank report, economic outlook report, they probably wouldn't even know about it. Nobody, nobody pays attention to this. They're do, in the past, they're doing business guide, very few people. I, I met once in New York at, around the UN with several CEOs. So I asked them, how many of you, when you go to a country to invest, read the doing business guide that the World Bank used to produce, something of that nature. And none of the CEOs were aware of this, that there even was such a document produced. And then we found out eventually that countries were paying off staff to put, rank them higher on the, on the index. So if you look at the oil market, and the people who forecast oil markets, you wouldn't turn to the World Bank as the authority on this. And oil markets are very fickle in nature. So you may have a glut today, but you have a shortage in the, in the future. Say, for example, a single event. So assuming if, if you had Iran not being able, say there was a sustain, like in the conflict with Israel, their oil assets were damaged. You remove nearly two million barrels per day from their world market. If you have, say, war or something in the shipping lanes, in the, um, like what the Hutu student in, from Yemen did. You can see closure of shipping lanes that cause oil prices to, to skyrocket. So a lot of these events are in the long run. They're driven by, by assumptions. But then things move. When you look at short markets, the spot markets, you tend to see a number of um, influencing factors. That's when global politics and even economics weigh in heavily. I don't, um, when you look at <coughs> capacity now, a lot of the oil majors have not been investing 
in, in fact, they're divesting a lot of their production resources. Leader of the People's National Congress Reform, PNC, Aubrey Norton on Friday, voiced his disagreement with the government's approach of deferring immediate revenue in hopes of securing greater future benefits from the oil sector. Norton was at the time speaking at the party's weekly press conference. Kaiter News had reported that the World Bank's latest Commodity Markets Outlook report, which forecasts an imminent oil surplus, has raised doubts about Vice President Dr. Bharat Jagdeo's projections of substantial future revenue. Jagdeo has suggested that by not implementing a ring-fencing provision for the oil projects in the Stabrook block, which is operated by ExxonMobil Guyana Limited, EMGL, the country is strategically foregoing short-term benefits to reap greater long-term gains. However, Norton has criticized this strategy, expressing skepticism toward the notion of sacrificing current income amidst forecasts of declining oil demand and potential price drops. Firstly, in his response to a question on the importance of ring fencing for Guyana's current oil projects in the Stabroke block, especially in light of the World Bank's projection of an oil blot and price reductions, Norton reiterated his party's position on ring fencing. In simple terms, a ring fencing provision in an oil contract ensures that each oil project is financially independent, meaning it can only use its revenue to cover its own costs. Once a project's expenses are repaid, profits are then split. However, the 2016 Production Sharing Agreement, PSA, with ExxonMobil lacks such a provision, and it allows Exxon and its partners Hess and CNOC to recover 75% of monthly revenue toward cost recovery, with the remaining 25% split equally between the companies and the government. Without ring fencing, Exxon and its partners can allocate costs from new developments across multiple projects, which delays profit distribution to Guyana. The PNCR leader said, VP confident of U.S. energy funding support as Trump begins second term. U.S. President-elect Donald Trump, with incoming First Lady Melania Trump. With the recent election of former President Donald Trump to a second non-consecutive term in the White House, it is not anticipated that the changing of the guard will pose problems for Guyana securing funding for energy projects, funding currently being sought from agencies such as the United States, U.S. Export-Import, Exim, Bank. This was according to Vice President and People's Progressive Party, Civic, PPPC, General Secretary Bharat Jagdeo, during a recent press conference, where he also expressed his congratulations for the election of Trump as the 47th President of the United States. The earlier Trump administration knew about the plot to rig the elections. The ambassador was here at that time. The ambassador saw the plot unfold before her very eyes. I recall her being in the um, Lennox John building and there at it's Ashmin's building right here, Ashmin's building, and people calling in a bomb threat and uncharacteristically, because normally you should spirit away the ambassador. The ambassador and others refused to leave, even with the bomb, bomb threat. They stood their ground. And so they saw the whole plot and the obscenity of it. And they know, they know the central players, they knew the central players in that plot. And they saw the repeated attempt to subvert the system. So, and these reports would have been filed with the State Department. So, if you talk about familiarity with the APNU and its, its crookedness, the earlier Trump administration would be very familiar with that. Jack does seems to believe these countries are run like how we run Guyana. He alone does everything and decides on everything. There are processes and systems in the United States that will not allow Jack Dio to do the ignorance he's doing. But the main thing Jack Dio must remember is this. Jack Deo should be the last to talk about lobbying Trump. It is the same Jack Deo regime that in an attempt to get power in 2020 agreed with the 
Americans to recognize Taiwan. Sorry, not to recognize, to establish a trade mission here for Taiwan. And then when they got in power and pressure come to them, they reneged on it. I don't know why he believed Trump will not be reminded that this is the chap and the government that prove untrustworthy a country and a political party dealing with foreign policy has to understand the interests of a country i am not one who live in the world that i'm going to engage trump or engage that person i look for the confluence of interests President Irfan Ali has instructed Agriculture Minister Zulfikar Mustafa to meet with representatives of the Guyana Sugar Corporation, GAIO, the Workers' Union, and other stakeholders to ascertain the cause of the worst sugar production output in history, despite the government pumping billions of dollars in the virtually paralyzed industry. Mr. Jagdeo indicated that he had learnt that Guy Suko's position was that it has expanded cultivation and would produce 60,000 to 70,000 tons this year. Clearly, that is below their target, so the Minister of Agriculture has to explain to the President why they are underperforming on their target and give a credible explanation, the Vice President said. Guy's UCO has refused to respond to concerns by the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union about the all-time low output and the reasons for the dismal performance. The Chief Executive Officer Paul Chin and the Public Relations Department had on two separate occasions failed to issue a promised statement. Vice President Barra Jardio said Dr. Ali was awaiting a report from the Agriculture Minister after the meeting with Guy's UCO management and a number of other people who have an interest or knowledge about sugar to get a report back to him. The Parliamentary Opposition of Partnership for National Unity Plus Alliance for Change and the Working People's Alliance has accused the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration of pumping more than $50 billion into Guy's UCO without any returns. But Mr. Jack Deal said the corporation was spending a lot of money on major conversion of beds to mechanization aimed at increasing output in the future. He said new cane varieties were being brought in from Brazil and possibly Cuba to increase yield. The corporation, he said, was suffering from some delayed maintenance and some management issues. GAU on October 28th said while Guy Suko's overall production target was approximately 70,000 tons, as of October 26, 2024, Guy Suko produced 24,711 tons, or just 39% of its second crop target of 63,276 tons. On top of that, the privately owned Stabrik News newspaper on Monday reported that the corporation's 2023 annual report, which was presented to the Office of the Auditor General, shows a $4.7 billion loss and a subsidy of $15 billion is from government. Already, the corporation has recorded sagging losses of $7.8 billion in 2021 and $10.2 billion in 2022. Target this year to 100,000 tons of sugar, and they indicated to Parliament that we want a $6 billion subvention for purposes of helping to, to create that 100,000 tons of sugar. Mm -hmm. It ended up in the very first year, which they had projected about 28,000 tons. They only made approximately 8,000 tons of sugar from all the estates, all the factories. Albion wow. couldn't work because they had big electrical fire and all that. Yes. So from the six billion you give them, they have just produced eight thousand tons of sugar. It is less than eight, seven point something ton, thousand tons. Then they came now for the year twenty twenty four to add to that by virtue of two supplementaries. They wanted one under a capital budget where they're asking for $3.2 billion and another one for current budget of $2.247 billion. That alone come up three, five point five billion, almost like $6 billion that they ask for at the beginning of the year. On Friday, Calvin Brutus and his wife, Adonica Alder, withdrew and discontinued yet another high court action, which they filed on the 19th of August, 2024 against the head of the Special Organized Crime Unit, SOQ, the Commissioner of Police and the Attorney General. 
In these proceedings, Mr. Brutus and his wife sought a number of orders, including an order to set aside or recall the order of court earlier granted, freezing their bank accounts. The application to withdraw and discontinue the proceedings was made orally when the matter was called yesterday by the attorney at law appearing for Mr. Brutus and his wife. This is the second set of proceedings filed and later withdrawn by Mr. Brutus and his wife. Another high court proceeding which was filed seeking permission for these two persons to leave the jurisdiction. Allegedly for medical attention for Ms. Aldo was heard by Justice Gino Prasad who, after hearing arguments from lawyers appearing for the Attorney General's chambers, dismissed the application and ordered the applicants to pay $250,000 each to the respondents, namely, the Attorney General, Commissioner of Police, and SOCU within six weeks from the date of the order. To date, these costs have not been paid. Upon the expiration of the six weeks, if these costs remain unpaid, the requisite legal steps will be taken to recover the same. Charge of admin of the Guyana Police Force as a senior superintendent when it's being held by assistant commissioner and deputy commissioner. And they, 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 they didn't look at early warnings, you know. They didn't look at early warnings. They, they, the chief justice was clear, self serving, was very, very clear. And that was the man in charge of admin. Only for in charge of finance. They had early warnings in incident. We had these cases in Barbies. Pay large sums of money. They pay for so they pay for, for cleaning lockups. When they get back labels and other people, large sums of money for cleaning lockups. We had on these coast allegations and we talking about allegations. Fiddling with the ex extra duty funds and, and all those other things, you know. The other thing is that we had early warnings. And they, 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 didn't, they didn't take a account of or they did anything in terms of the old, old warnings. Or as uh, my good friend Patrick Mento, when he was in charge of the strategic management unit, he used to say, well, early warning systems or early intervention systems. And coming back to a point that I made several times ago, that it's time that the police get a behavioral science unit to deal with ranks at all levels from senior super senior senior officer right down the line. So there is no behavioral science unit that can pick up early warnings, that can pick up when people are self-serving and, and, and take the, the, the necessary action. Havana, Reuters, a 6.8 magnitude earthquake rocked eastern Cuba today, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, shaking buildings in Santiago de Cuba, the island's second largest city, and the surrounding countryside. The quake struck Cuba's southeastern coast in Granma province near the municipality of Bartolomé Maso, the home of former Cuban leader Fidel Castro's headquarters during the Cuban Revolution. Reuters spoke with several residents in the area who reported the quake felt as strong as any in their lifetimes. Homes and buildings shook violently, they said, and dishes rattled off shelves. Some damage was reported in Pylon, near the quake's epicenter. Many of the region's homes and buildings are older and vulnerable. The quake was at a depth of 14 kilometers. 8.7 miles, USGS said. The earthquake was earlier measured at a magnitude of 5.8, a figure that has been revised upwards. The U.S. National Tsunami Warning Center said there was no tsunami threat expected as a result of this quake. The quake is the most recent in a string of natural disasters to strike Cuba. Much of the eastern end of the island was ravaged by Hurricane Oscar in October. Last week, Cuba's national grid collapsed after Hurricane Rafael hit the western end of the island, leaving 10 million without power. Recovery efforts are still underway. Rolling blackouts remain the norm across much of eastern Cuba, where Sunday's earthquake struck, complicating communications. Most seismic activity in Cuba takes place in the region around Santiago. A fault line runs along the island's southeastern coast, marking the boundary between the North American Plate and the Caribbean Plate, according to Cuba's seismic service. The Cuban capital of Havana was not affected by the quake. Cuba was shaken near Bartolomé Maso, Granma, by an earthquake of magnitude 6.0, the European Mediterranean Seismological Center reported. 
The quake hit at a shallow depth of 17 kilometers beneath the epicenter near Bartolome Marso, Granma, Cuba, in the morning on Sunday, November 10, 2024, at 10.50 a.m. local time. Shallow earthquakes are felt more strongly than deeper ones as they are closer to the surface. The exact magnitude, epicenter, and depth of the quake might be revised within the next few hours or minutes as seismologists review data and refine their calculations, or as other agencies issue their report. Our monitoring service identified a second report from the German Research Center for Geosciences, GFZ, which listed the quake at magnitude 6.0 as well. Other agencies reporting the same quake include France's Réseau National de Surveillance Sismique, RAINES, at magnitude 5.4, and the Colombian Geological Service, SGC, at magnitude 5.6. Based on the preliminary seismic data, the quake should have been widely felt by almost everyone in the area of the epicenter, it might have caused light to moderate damage. Moderate shaking probably occurred in Bartolome Marso, located 30 kilometers from the epicenter, and Yara 42 kilometers away. In Campechuela, located 54 kilometers from the epicenter, Manzanillo 54 kilometers away, Contramaster 82 kilometers away, and Santiago de Cuba 113 kilometers away, the quake should have been felt as light shaking. As soon as we heard about this earthquake, we came right down here to Southwest 8th Street, where many people here today were just getting the news, and you'll see in the story, very concerned, trying to get in contact with relatives. The challenge now is to actually reach loved ones. An earthquake in Cuba and the emotional shock waves felt right here in South Florida. We are outside Cafe Versailles. This woman trying to get in contact with family. The earthquake with a preliminary magnitude of 6.8 shook eastern Cuba on Sunday. This after weeks of hurricanes and blackouts that have left many on the island reeling. The epicenter of the quake was located about 25 miles south of Bartolome Maso, Cuba. <laughs> Oh, yeah, fuck it up, little